uh, welcome back. If there's anyone who wasn't here to see the screening of the of the movie, uh, welcome. We are meeting here on the lands of the Kumbhameri people, uh, the wider Yugan Bay language group, and I, on your behalf, pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words to start off before we get into a discussion with our panelists. And I guess the first thing I'd say is that the current housing crisis, we may have become increasingly aware of its impact in the last couple of years. And perhaps as the documentary was saying, uh, COVID kind of exacerbated many elements of it. But this is something that's been a long time in the making, decades in the making. So it's not something that's crept up on us unexpectedly. We've been doing it's a result of things that we've been doing, kind of consciously or unconsciously, as as governments or as community groups or as individuals um, for a long time. Um, and I think we there is a tendency, um, and I'm glad I would say that this film doesn't fall into it, where although we looked at individual people who were experiencing the housing crisis, there has often in the past been a tendency to focus on individuals and looking for explanations for a housing crisis in their characteristics and in their circumstances. Um, but I would suggest to you, and feel free to disagree and, and we have a bit of time at the end for discussion, uh, to argue if you like, that I think this is part of a wider more complex set of structural forces. It's not just the result of uh, individuals and, and their particular problems. Um, the other thing I'd say is that because uh, this crisis has been a long time in the making, it will take a long time to solve it. it. You know, Our biggest mistake is to think that there is a silver bullet out there. There's one thing that we can do that will make a major impact um, I don't personally think that's the case. We can explore that a bit with our panelists in a moment. But I think it's a, a case of looking at long-term, medium-term, and short-term things that we can do. So I think there's a political battle over long-term issues. And some of these things, we, we find it increasingly, or not increasingly, continually difficult to talk about. Um, Politicians, our, our representatives, often don't like talking about things. And when certain things that maybe are to do with broader macroeconomic factors and long-term changes to things like the taxation regime, they, they've, they've been bitten and they're shy about talking about that in the future. Um, so these things are going to take time. I mean, I think we will have to confront them eventually, but it may not be uh, in the immediate future. Uh, so I think there are long-term discussions and debates that we have to have. Um, but in the medium term, I think it is about, and it was, it was mentioned in the documentary, and it gets talked about a lot, um, there is a housing shortage. Having said that, and I can't remember the figures, Jackson will know that I'm sure, um, if we utilised the housing that stock that we've got to its full extent, there would not be a crude short a crude difference between you know households and dwellings in australia there's a lot of underutilized uh space and housing space underutilized for a whole variety of reasons um but nevertheless there is i would say a pretty widespread consensus that we need to build more dwellings and probably build more variety of dwellings at the moment there's a bit of a polarization between you know, three, four bedroom detached houses or high rise apartments. Um, and we need more in between. Um, so we need a greater variety of housing. I think we need uh, for that additional housing to be located in sensible places because we can certainly choose to um, build a lot of new houses in places that, in my view, aren't especially appropriate. But even those short-term measures, and there's a lot of policy initiatives around now, financial ones, there are regulatory ones that are, that are aimed at increasing the, the supply of housing. And, and, and that's good. They will take effect. Uh, whether there's enough, um, and whether it will take effect quickly enough is a, is a matter for debate. But, you know, we're, we're on that road. But it will still take time. There are, you know, there are initiatives now. I don't know if uh, the current housing bill that's uh, in being debated uh, down in Canberra at the moment, if that were to be passed now um, and allow certain new initiatives, you still wouldn't see something in the ground that you could occupy for a few years because you can't 
throw up a house overnight. So that brings me to, I guess, the short-term question. And what would we want to say if those, any of those women were in the room with us now to them if they say, well, I'm living in my van or my car now. I hope that you're going to be able to provide a greater choice of stuff that's uh, well-designed, appropriate, located, more or less uh, affordable, but it's going to take time. Do you just want me to keep living in my car or my van for two, three, four, five years? Or are there things that we can do and should do or think about in the short term? And I think that can be very politically challenging because so some would argue that, you know, if you do these short-term fixes, it takes the pressure off the medium to long-term fixes, and that would be detrimental, and we might have a discussion about that. Um, so those are some of the things that I think uh, we might cover and that you might want to think about. Let me now just very briefly introduce our panellists. Uh, first up, Maggie Shambrook. Uh, Maggie's a community activist founding member of the Housing Older Women Movement, uh, and she combines kind of academic research experience with lived experience and a very strong commitment to the promotion of social justice in, in housing, especially for women. So welcome, Maggie. Uh, next to her, uh, Jackson Hills. Jackson is currently the manager for policy and strategic engagement at Q Shelter. Uh, that's the Queensland part of Shelter. We did have, you may have seen on earlier uh, announcements about this event that uh, Emma Greenholsch was going to be with us. She's the CEO of National Shelter. Uh, and until she realized that she had to be in Canberra because it's a sitting week this week, uh, she would have been a panelist as well. She sends her apologies. Um, uh, but anyway, Jackson is uh, uh, with Q Shelter and he's a board member also of Common Ground Queensland, which is a, an organization that advocates for community housing solutions. Uh, and last but not least, Gregory Peel-Smith. He, he's told me, I, I called him Greg, and he said, that's your one opportunity to call me Greg. Uh, it's Gregory. Uh, Gregory's a research fellow at Southern Cross University and co-chair of N Street Sleeping Collaboration. Uh, he draws on his lived experience of homelessness and trauma and recovery. And you might have read his book, Out of the Forest, or seen him on ABC's Australian Story a few years back. So please join me in welcoming our panellists. Right, I'm, I'm going to sit down, and then I'm going to put a few questions initially. And if I may, I'll start with you, Jackson, um, with a question about you operate in the kind of advocacy space, you engage with policymakers at local, state, federal government, um, trying to persuade them to see things and do things differently and perhaps act more quickly. Do you think, do you get the sense that those politicians have a real sense of the urgency and the immediacy of the crisis? Or as they're sometimes portrayed, they're a bit detached, they're in the Canberra bubble or they're in City Hall or Town Hall and they're a bit detached from that? Or, or do you think they really appreciate the seriousness of what's going on? Yeah, good place to start. Um, look, I, I think uh, there's been a big shift in the last couple of years. That's where I'd start. So why? Um, well, we just saw a, a, about the housing impacts after COVID um, and this has started to affect not just people who might have traditionally been homeless, people on the, the very low incomes in the income distribution, but many more people in our community, people on income quintile two, income quintile three, um, you know, people that are in the public service, um, people that are connected to politicians, some politicians. Um, and so as a result, um, this has become a more broadly understood issue. I think the media spotlight on the issue in that period too has, has really helped um, that case, that plight. Um, and I think most governments now, all the state and territory governments and the federal government, and, and to be honest, most local governments too, even though it hasn't traditionally been part of their remit, are starting to lean into this issue. The question is, are we focused on the right policy and investment settings to get the best impact? Now, that part you can debate. I reckon in the last three years, there's been a real seismic shift in the focus on these issues, but we've still got a very, very long way to go. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maggie, if I could throw one at you, I mean, as I said earlier, I think there's a there can be a bit of a tension between um, focusing on individuals and broader structural forces. 
um, and also on the capacity, perhaps, of the private market to solve things like that. Do you do you think the market has the market <laughs> has been very good uh, at addressing these changing needs? Um, do you think it's about reforming or assisting the way the private market works, or do you think there's a need for more government intervention in ways that that actually listen to the the needs and the preferences of older women in particular? Yes. What is it? Retreat, go round. Uh, re uh, what is it? Um, retreat, advance, go round. And I often think about that military strategy, about every kind of step we take. Is it a, an opportunity to advance or retreat or go around the whole thing? And in terms of the market, I think it's probably about going round it is where we've ended up. Yeah. Um, partially because the market will do what the market does. And 66% of Australians are probably pretty happy with what the market does um, because the market has produced wealth for that 66% of people who can participate in the owning of homes. So, um, and they don't really see very often or in any great degree, I don't think, except for the wonderful people who've turned up tonight to watch this particular documentary. And for those that have a kind of interest, a social justice perspective, that they care about what's going on. But there's probably more nimbyism, which is not in my backyard, um, concerns for most people than there is, yes, in my backyard people. Um, we have got used to, as a nation, owning our own home on a fairly large block of land. And it does seem to me that that market kind of position is changing, where we have a very large house on a very small block of land. And so that eliminates some of the options that might have come about if we're able to look at that sector differently. But I do think that sector itself needs to look at its fellow citizens' differently as well and better understand the nature of what's going on here and how easy it is to get excluded from that system. If you can fall out of that system pretty easily really, to be honest, and um, and it's hard to get back in once you're out. The older you get, the harder it would be to get back in. Um, and there was very truthful statements put forward by those very brave women who told their stories because that's not an easy story to tell in the face of um, a population that really believes that if you're not in your own home, then you've failed somehow to do what you have to do as a citizen, which is to own your own home. So... Um, so it is. it takes a lot to stand up and say, hang on a minute, there's another story to be told here. And it takes a lot for you too to listen to that story and react to that story in a compassionate and empathetic way that brings about some change. But our view as a movement is that we have to go around the problem and create more housing choices with different forms of tenure and different non-speculative, that is non-market related options. Um, because the only options we've got in that space at the moment is social housing um, and uh, that's not, it's just not adequate really to meet the diversity of needs of various cohorts of people impacted by this issue. So um, I'm, I came to Australia 17 years ago from the UK, um, a country with a perhaps a longer and kind of broader tradition of social housing, council housing as we used to call it. Um, I, When I was a undergraduate student in London, I lived in council housing, council housing that the Greater London Council couldn't persuade anyone else even on the housing waiting list to, to take, so they opened it. They opened it up and said, it's open to anyone. And of course, to, you know, 21-year-old students, we go, yeah, we'll, we'll take that. Yeah. Um, I guess my point is that one of the things I find intriguing in Australia is the, the kind of attitude, and I wonder if any of you have a sense that it's shifting, that the perception of social housing broadly is changing and will need to change if we are to increase provision in a way that isn't kind of stigmatising, because I think there's still this view that, you know, social housing is 
a transitional ter um, ten uh, tenancy for people who've got problems Correct. to give them a bit of breathing space to sort out their problems yes. and then they can go out and the market will it's look a after them. Thing. It's a transitional thing. tenure, yeah, not tenancy. It's, it's um, and and I don't know, I think my sister lives in Germany and you know she's lived in rent, not social housing, but she's lived in private rented housing, the same house for 15 years. I mean the right. idea that somebody could, that she might get tipped out for no good reason or her rent put up egregiously is just unheard of you know yeah. there's no stigma about living in the private rental sector yeah. and there are plenty of european countries where social housing is perfectly respectable exactly. I, I, I get a sense we've got a bit further to go in australia well, we've got to go back to where we were actually because in the 1950s to be frank um my mother, who I was six months old, and my mother went in the 1950s, sat in the local member's office. She was pregnant with my sister as well. And she said, I'm not leaving here until I've got the keys to a house. Now, that was houses were being built in this little country town, huge estates of public housing, really good timber homes on quarter acre blocks. And, we got, and my mother left that afternoon with a set of keys, and I grew up in that house. Um, I spent 17 years of my life there um, and it was a good solid base on which we we were able to function as a family and live our lives, you know. Um, and that was because housing at that point was, a, was considered to be a human right. Even one of the commissioners in the development of that housing called it a human right. But somehow we lost that. And my dad was a working class man, worked really hard all his life and so did my mother. Eventually she went back to work um, in very uh, low paid jobs. But um, they were working class people. And um, Dad worked out putting poles and wires up, you know, for the nation's communication system. So... Um, it wasn't seen with the same stigma that it is now. The reason we've got the stigma, stigma now is that we, we were never in Queensland above 3.4 or 5% of public housing in this state. Other states had up to 8 and 9%. We were only ever up to 3.4. It fell back in about 2000 to about 3%, just over 3%, and we're still at that rate now. And to make it viable for the hundred, like there's 50,000 people on the wait list currently for that housing. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's 20, 20 something thousand applicants, but that, those applicants represent a, a residency of 50 odd thousand people. And those people, to get, to manage those wait lists, you get a deficit assessment process now. So you're assessed on, what deficits you have rather than what attributes you have. Um, so that means you're the sicker, the older, the more frail, the more, the more unwell, the more mentally unwell, the more um, all of that, all those boxes sort of get ticked and then get onto the list. Yeah. So it's now become a very, uh, a list of people who are very um, vulnerable in a whole range of ways, you know. And uh, our cohort can't even sometimes get on that list. So, so I'll, I'll come back to that in in a minute. But if I could move to you, Gregory, and I suppose, um, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, there there has been a kind of traditional view that um, homeless people are predominantly people with a a range and perhaps a complex range of particular personal problems. Uh, and they're, they're there for those reasons rather than for any kind of structural reasons. Now, that's not to say that um, people uh, who experience homelessness don't have those kind of conditions, but I just wonder if you can say a bit about flipping it the other way, which is that if you find yourself in a position of housing stress, whether you're sleeping rough or precariously or in a van or whatever, like what that does to your your mental health and well-being and your outlook on life because it strikes me that you know if you didn't have those problems when you became homeless you're pretty soon going to acquire them or they will grow within you it becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy it's a good way to put it Paul self-fulfilling prophecy because I think there's a little period before a person walks across that threshold for the last time uh, and 
and that that period is you know often not always often people can sense that something's coming they can they feel that they you know they're in trouble so the anxiety starts to creep in the fear starts to creep in and that's a fear of the unknown what am i going to do where am i going to go how am i going to cope with this then there's a little period where sometimes isolation starts to take place because shame starts to creep in and you start to tap into that idea of stigma and so you don't feel that you can talk to your closest friends or your your family about this you know and i think the lady uh said it well in in that um film you know um she didn't she didn't want to burden the other people with her problems because you know it's, it's a funny thing you know the small things we'll burden someone with but when we really need to talk to somebody about these big problems we don't want to burden anybody with it you know all of a sudden our shoulders grow why do we want to carry carry that for ourselves you know and they're the ones we should talk about so there's that little period before you walk across that threshold for the last time but then i see three stages once you've crossed that threshold and that the first one is a, a short period of time of you know two or, two or three weeks where if a person can receive a little bit of a support you know just maybe they can um turn their emotions turn their feelings turn their fears around and it was said again in this in this film it's about providing a purpose for someone someone needs a you know you walk across that threshold and you lose purpose but if you can regain purpose then you can establish some hope but if you don't have that hope then that's where those those um those unknown fears start to get names the fear of a bashing the fear of assault the fear of abuse the fear of being moved on the fear of being arrested there's a whole lot of things in there um for some people those over a period of time those fears turn into paranoia schizophrenia addiction there's a whole lot of them you can list them all off um and it's i think it's a very complex area as well so so maggie i don't know about if your experience in some of the groups you work with yeah. um how you manage to kind of balance the fact that that as gregory was saying you need to kind of support people perhaps to get them to help change their attitude a bit or the or reduce their pessimistic outlook but if on the other hand there's nothing on offer you know if you say well we can put you on the waiting list but at this point unless you deteriorate seriously you're going to be on that waiting list for 10 years in the meantime it's going to be added to so you probably go backwards um how how do you in those kind of settings balance the fact of trying to say to somebody you know have a bit of hope yeah if there isn't any hope practical hope that you can offer people because you know you've got to fight for the things that matter really it's not going to come to you out of the blue you know sometimes you've got to really fight for them and you've got to build your hope with the hope that comes from others um being willing to fight with you and that's really why the movement's so important we managed to get a funded service because some of us were doing that case work in our own as volunteers in our own time you know yeah. and we we can't sustain this this is not um sustainable so what we did was go with Kew Shelter support and Kew Shelter was there at the very beginning of all of this the development of the movement and with their support we wrote submissions to the government we got a funded service now it operates here on the gold coast it operates um across southeast queensland it's just opened some offices up in mckay it's going to open offices and we were just in a meeting with them today with state government talking about how this service is working 
it's got a four month wait list already. And it's been operating probably two or three years now, but it's overwhelmed with demand. And this is women over 55. That it's not everybody else who's experiencing housing difficulty. It's just that cohort. And, um, and so we're very pleased though, that the government has, uh, has uh, recognized that and recognize the legacy issues that these women are bringing into this space of being precarious and, and at risk, you know? Um, so it's really good, but it is about fighting and, and talking to people like coming here tonight. I've spent half my day in a, in a forum with, local, uh, with state government. I got in the car, I live in North Brisbane, and I drive here to sit and talk with you tonight and say to you, we need your support as citizens in this country because you might be a professional, you might be an architect, you might be a planner, you might be someone who works in retail, I don't know, whatever you do, but you're also a citizen. And the opportunity is now to talk to your candidates in your local area and say, this is not good enough. We cannot have our grandmothers, aunts, cousins and whatever in these situations of vulnerability. And we must do something and we can do something to make a difference here. And we want to know what your plan is to fix this, to make this better. And can I say the issue that I think gives hope is about women having a sense of agency and say over this. You don't have, you don't, your vulnerability is, um, oh, your vulnerability is, is decreased, increased greatly when you don't think, when you think you're alone. If you know that you're not alone and that others are going to fight the good fight with you, you can find all sorts of strengths within yourself that you never knew you had. And none of cha change in terms of um, wealth distribution, in terms of um, equity in our society and justice in our society has never come about just because somebody thought it was a nice idea to do something nice. <laughs> it's come about, our, our domestic and family violence laws have come about because women said, you have to do something about this. We can't be killed all the time and be maimed and hurt. You have to put in place protections. Um, and various, all the things in my lifetime that have made structural change and difference, we had to fight for. Yeah. We, had to, we had to put our nose to the grindstone and we had to find partners like Q Shelter and other organisations to work with us to make those changes. So I think it's possible. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, J Jackson, can I just ask you um, again from a, where you sit and where you yep. work, um, whether you are optimistic that um, the different parties at all levels of government are willing to put aside partisan politics in order to pursue policies and strategies that my sense is that you know, if, if they come and speak to you and equivalent people, they will get a pretty consistent message. There's not a lot of infighting within the people working in this field and if politicians choose to kind of accept that advice and go I'm not going to just oppose this because that party is supporting it therefore I'm the opposition so I'll oppose it for the sake of it that's my worry yep. are you yeah. are you worried or are you optimistic that they that they can abandon a bit of or give up a bit of uh, partisan point scoring for the good of yeah. This cause. Well, my glass is empty, and that's not an omen for the answer to that question, by the way. But um, no, I am optimistic. I'm a little bit like Maggie. I, th I do think, you know, the great phrase is um, policy um, change moves at the pace of public opinion. And I think Maggie's absolutely right. Those major changes, if you think about superannuation guarantee or, you know, a whole range of different things in our society, the, you know, the public apology, you know, some of the major reforms in our history have come off big movements. And I think at the moment we're in one of those times around housing insecurity. Um, and I, I think to answer the question more specifically, though, do I think the parties can achieve it by working together? Um, uh, one example I'll give you in Queensland at the moment, we've got our election on the 26th of October, as many of you would know. Make sure you vote. Um, it's important. Um, but 
you know, the two major parties have committed to the same housing supply targets, which are linked to population growth in Queensland. That's really important. We haven't had that for a long time. We've never actually had that, to be honest. Some of our regional plans have had targets, but to have a statewide dwelling target linked to population with a social housing target linked to that, um, so it's a million homes by 2046, 53,500 social homes by that period. It's about 2,000 social homes per year required. Um, both parties have agreed to that. So, I mean, that's that's a start. There's a lot of um, nuance that sits underneath that, and that's where the conjecture is. And, you know, it's around tax and it's around approach and the rental market and, um, and all of that. But at that macro level, there's agreement. Um, one of the things, I, I, just to riff off one of Maggie's points, then I'll let you go back along the panel again, Paul, is I think... We've got to challenge our candidates, though, in this election a little bit too because I find that target is one thing. That's in the abstract. But then it comes down to the local electorate where there's a project proposed and it might be a mixed dwelling of some social homes, some affordable homes and some market homes, if, if you understand that lingo. And it might be a medium density tower. I don't know, maybe it's 10 storey. And it might be a bit different to what we've seen before. But the Gold Coast has got one of the most rapid rates of population growth um, in the country. And it's got the highest unmet housing need in the country as well. So I think what's happening is if every project of scale, some of them aren't right, some of them aren't right, but if every project at scale gets beat by community opposition, we're never going to meet those housing targets. So that's that thing about nimbyism versus yimbyism. Like these are our um, grandkids, um, you know, the teachers in our schools and everything else. So at some point we've got to grapple with that. We can't just commit to the abstract target yeah. and then not support the projects locally. So I think that's something we all need to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Um, Gregory, I wanted to put something to you, which is the Gold Coast is a is a an interesting and a but a, a somewhat peculiar city because it's so tourism dominated, and that's changing. But it, it you know tourism isn't going to go away. One of the drivers of tourism is image and perception, and one of the things that worries me a bit is that. If the crisis increasingly manifests itself in a place like the Gold Coast through people sleeping in cars or camping in the dunes or whatever, that there might be a pressure building up to say, this is, a, this is damaging our reputation and, and our tourism base. So can, whatever we're going to do, can we also just kind of clear these people out of the way? I have a similar fear a bit about Brisbane and the 2032 Olympics because we've seen that in other international cities around the world that have hosted major events there's a sometimes a tendency to say we can't have the the tourists who paid a lot of money coming to see the games or whatever you know having to step over rough sleepers in the doorways it, it, am i again being overly pessimistic or it, what, what's your view on a, a, a peculiar place like the gold coast uh and the way it might perceive its increasing and growing homeless population wow <laughs> Firstly, I don't know that um, the Gold Coast is certainly different. I don't know that it's peculiar in this sense. The next thing is we've already seen this um, move, move uh, the clearing of the streets for major events often in this country. Uh, in fact, it's actually quite common when you start to dig into it. The other thing is, well, look, I lived in the, on the beaches near Southport for the first part of my undergrad. I wrote the first um, series of essays and done my study um, in the sand dunes. Um, the, other thing, the other thing I noticed about the Gold Coast is that it, you know, the the local government is really important here because as we get as new mayors come in, they have this agenda, and I've seen a series of mayors make it so difficult for that that lower socioeconomic group to actually live here. You know, they had a vision of a Florida, Tampa type. Um, geographical area with this magic city with, you know, the sun glinting off all the windows. And they really had that agenda. They tried to build that and they kept, they made it so difficult for women on pensions, single mums, um, 
students, young students, to be able to live here. And there's a residual effect to that. And that, that um, you know, the results of those uh, policies, those attitudes, that thinking is going to linger on here for quite some time. It will, it will pass, it will get, but not yet. There's not enough political will at the moment and, the, and more importantly, it's not just the politi polit political will. There's a little key that winds up political attitude and that is the middle class, that, that, that opinion, that social opinion of the middle class. And uh, the middle class at the moment around the Gold Coast are quite content with where they're at and they don't want to change because it might ruin their investment. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's in, I think one of the things that I find really powerful about that undercover film is that, you know, those, those women, you, you look at it and you go, that could be, you know, that's my grand, that's my auntie. You know, they're, they're people that you know. And I think as that takes hold, we might see a, a, shift, in, uh, a shift in attitude that, again, it's not, they mentioned the stereotype of, you know, the the older man on the park bench. You know, there's there's more to homelessness than that, um, and people will increasingly realise that because because it's unavoidable. Now, Jemima at the back is is giving me um, signals that say we said we should try and allow a bit of time at the end for questions. So uh, now is your opportunity to um, throw a question or two, if you can keep it as succinct as possible that would be good and Jemima will run around with the microphone as she has done if, if, if it, you can either have it as a general question or you can say this is to whoever it's to whoever can answer it <laughs> uh, we've heard a lot about um, the size of this or as, uh, other aspect of a problem um, in the film a figure was cited that upwards of 400,000 women are at risk of homelessness. Does anybody know how many of them are actually homeless right now? My guess is that if anyone knows the answer to that question, it will be back. You know, on a, on a local or a, or a state or, or a federal level? Well, thank you. numbers vary a lot. And part of the challenge with numbers, as you might imagine, is that the women impacted are very invisible. It is very difficult to get the numbers right. With this, with this issue. Um, but there is some research being done right now and we've just, there's been some research done on the 2021 20, um, census um, figures or data that suggest that I think the numbers are like, <laughs> they're not saying that this is a homeless this is the number of homeless women right now. The figures say that there are more people retire, moving into um, this age group um, in, on the Gold Coast and in southeast Queensland who do not own their own home and are, who are in private rental and experiencing considerable rental stress. So... The figures say, and, that, and those percentages have increased rapidly of people who are now not able to, because the, the age pension was based in, on, on a premise that you own your own home and that you are in a position where that pension benefit is really just to top you up, if you like, and to help you because you have no housing costs except your annual rates. That's all, and maintenance or whatever that you might have. But as you see more people falling into the category of not owning their own home and moving into age pension um, territory, if you like, and the fact that women, the statistics on women are that we, on average, um, have something like a hundred and $20,000 if we're lucky in superannuation. That number is often around fifty or 60000 in reality. So, and that 
money disappears in about two or three years if you're paying private rental. So that means you've got no savings left, and that was the story of some of the women on this uh, film. You've got no savings left, you used it all up, and you're on an age pension which does not support your housing. Jackson, you got any more? Oh, I'll just add that in, in a more of a numeric sense, that, that's absolutely true, as Maggie said. And I think you've got to look at the homelessness population as a bit, and the census does this as a bit of a pipeline too. So, and I hate to use that word, it's a housing supply sort of term as well. But, you know, at that point in, the number's smaller in terms of absolute homelessness, particularly rough sleeping. Um, so in Queensland, absolute numbers across all cohorts, about 22,500, I think, in the 2021 census, absolutely homeless, recorded on census night, underreported because it's hard to actually get that data through surveying, as you probably know. But then behind the 22,000, about 150,000 households in Queensland in housing stress. Now, that also includes some of this cohort. Housing stress being people on the bottom two income quintiles, so bottom 40% of all incomes, spending more than 30% of their household income, which is usually benefits payments, on rental costs. So you got 150,000 pushing into that 22,000 number. And then there's another number behind that, another number behind that, as you can probably appreciate. So hence the concern. How about that way? I, the problem is often quantified that way, but it somehow needs to be termed into a number of living, breathing people. People yeah. and and you have to estimate yeah. it, but still, it can has I to add be people? If I can add one though that I think might be helpful to that, I, and I, you know, Paul mentioned in the intro, I'm involved with Common Ground, which is a form of supportive housing, and um, we know this helps people that have been chronically homeless sleeping on the street. So you know, imagine you know one of your hotspots is Kerry Park. Rob's still in the audience. I think Kerry Park's been hotspot down here. Southport Community Centre, Burley, Coolangatta, Labrador, etc. So people that have been sleeping in those conditions for several years, been picked up in a housing solution with intensive support. Um, housing those people appropriately through that model is $17,500 cheaper per tenant per year savings to the government than actually letting them sleep rough on the street because of the interventions with the justice system, emergency health, primary health care, all that sort of stuff, interaction with local business. So that's one person. Um, and that's not even about the person. I just mean in a numerical sense about one person. Um, the economic argument, even beyond the social argument, is strong for housing these people appropriately. We just don't have the supply, Paul, though. That's the other point. The supply isn't there. Can I just add to that, Jackson? That, and that's that's the economic argument that needs to dissolve this bipartisan bipartisanism yes. in the in the in that both the national and state level of politics, because there's Canadian research that says for every ten dollars that you invest in taking a rough sleeper off the street, you'll get uh, Eleven dollars fifty return. So if you, I mean that's a small figure in from what I'm talking about. But you start multiplying that into your seventeen thousand dollars per person, uh, and that ends up that adds up to a lot of money. So you know we talk about you know this the neoliberal age and this uh, this economic rationalisation of humanity. You know, if you want to start to apply economic figures, they actually work out that what, they, what the figures actually say is that governments should be investing a whole lot more into this sector. Because it's economically rational to do so. You, you can forget the moral argument. It is it's economically a, irrational to not, not to do it. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any more questions? Just feel free to put your hand up. There's... Jemima will run around. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, we talked about a lot of the problems and you came up with a few ideas of solutions. One of the solutions was now especially with the the election coming close, speak to the candidates. So that's question number one. What is your suggestion? What is most effective in arguments to talk to your candidates that will not be just promises but uh, also show result in actions? And secondly, apart from talking to the candidates, what can we as 
just normal concerned citizens do effectively to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jackson. Um, well, you can go to our website, www.housingolderwomen.org.au, and there are, I spent a couple of weekends putting a list of candidates together that you can contact. Now, I haven't got the Cata Party candidates and some of the independents, but I've got the Greens, Labor and the Liberal Party candidates, phone numbers and email addresses, so you can contact them. And I've put them on our website in, under the news and updates. And I've also put links to letters that you can use as a template and a series of policy matters that you could raise. So you can get that information from our website. And I, Rapidly Q Shelter has a similar tool that you could use to raise these issues. And just a phone call. Honestly, if they, if if a candidate receives like twenty emails around one issue, that's a big deal. Like seriously, it doesn't take much for them to go. Hell, what's going on here? Um, because we're so inactive as a citizenry in terms of. Um, really um, activating our democracy. You know, we don't do it enough. And therefore, when, it, when we start to do it, they kind of perk up a bit and look at what's going on here. The other thing in terms of how you can support everyday citizen sort of um, actions, we're looking at developing community-led housing. That's one thing. And that um, we want to try to get um, some demonstration projects up for some missing middle type 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 housing in uh, across southeast Queensland. But there's organisations like uh, Q Shelter as well that really will give you lots of, you know, interesting, um, keep up to date with stuff, get lots of research, get lots of information and talk to your neighbours and talk to people around you about it. You know, the, a lot of people do not know that this issue exists or that it exists in a way that it isn't that person's own fault and own doing. Like if they had got their act together, then they wouldn't be in this situation. That is so untrue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jackson, yeah, yeah. I'll oh, real quick add, oh, there's such a great list of activities there from Maggie. And I think the power of working together, like how is a great example of that. It's one of the best forms of advocacy we've got for a cohort specific issue in this space at the moment, they're doing great work. But there's obviously need in every single cohort. Youth is another fast growing area of homelessness. Um, you know, young families, mums with kids through um, um, separations and DV and family violence, unfortunately. So organising as a group and presenting to the, the political candidates is really important because, as Maggie said, it's usually, having worked there, it's usually done on aggregate. How many people have complained about this issue this week? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Um, another thing you might think about going away from tonight is you've been at this forum, you've heard, you've watched this great movie, which is a great um, demonstration of what's going on. Write into the Gold Coast Bulletin. Get in the opinion page. Put your views out there. Start a Facebook group. Get some people involved in it. The groups that are actually having impact on, on the um, NIMBYism side are very active and they're the groups that we're actually up against. So when the development project comes forward, those groups activate really quickly. They're straight onto the poly. They're straight down to the consultation sessions. They're straight away in the paper. So the other side of the argument needs to get better at organising itself and putting forward its views as well so there's some balance in that conversation. Um, I mean, I would just reinforce that as I speak as a planner that all of these initiatives typically at some point have to literally hit the ground. You know, something has to happen in a particular place, whether it's, you know, new, new housing developments of, of different types or it's projects that are servicing people. They happen in places... And as Jackson said, I mean, the, the, the people who go, no, I'm all in favour of doing something. This is a really important issue. We've got to do something about it, literally, but not here. Can you just do it over there? Because I don't want this happening here. Um, we need, I think, to go, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't just keep pushing it somewhere else. And I think the balance, when I look as a planner at sometimes the balance of submissions that get made, sometimes you get the impression that, you know, Newspapers or radio stations will say, there's overwhelming local opposition. And you look at it and you go, there were six emails. Yeah, that's right. you know, it's not overwhelming opposition. You know, there's 6,000 people live in that area. <laughs> so actually a small number, you know, appear to create a lot of resistance, but a small number can create support as well. So, uh, yeah, Gregory, were you, you yeah. uh, you're off, sorry. Yeah, look, um, 
I've been in discussions with the New South Wales government um, over the last couple of weeks. And what I want to bring here is a little bit of exciting news. Uh, it shouldn't be exciting news, but I feel that it is. And that is that um, the discussions with the politicians in New South Wales are starting to link homelessness, rough sleeping with domestic violence and family violence. Yeah, and this has been a long time coming. And I think there needs to be a lot more um, awareness and education around the links between these because, you know, family violence, domestic violence creates a lot of unsafe spaces. Unsafe, unsafe spaces are vacated very quickly. And this creates a problem. And I think it's something that with some early intervention, some understanding, I think, I think we can make a big difference here. Um, I'm conscious, <laughs> I'm trying to read <laughs> Jemima's sign language there, which, <laughs> which I'm taking. What, and do we have another question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, there, there we go, look. Improvisation, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Um, no, no, just speak into it. Oh, okay. Um, you raised, in your introduction to this forum, you were saying the, the stock's there, if we could use it. What is your thinking or what's happening in that space of utilising what we've already got in a, in a much better way? So, I mean, really quickly, so what Paul's referring to is census night, a million homes available, usually is the number you'll hear reported. So a million homes around the country available. Some of that is stock under construction that's probably not available to be lived in. But there'll be other reasons why it's vacant and um, we need to interrogate that a little bit further. Let's just call it 750,000 properties around the country or, or even 500,000. Just saw that there's 400,000 women in need. Do you know what I mean? It was 22,000 homeless in Queensland. So it could be really useful. So there needs to be more interrogation of that. And then the other thing that we have is just um, a diminishing size, household size in Australia. So that's shrinking. So down to about 2.5 per dwelling, I think, or even 2.3. Yeah. So they're spare bedrooms, actually, yeah. not spare homes. They're spare bedrooms. And I think sometimes economists will often look at that and go, well, that's just about sharing rooms. And I think that's a bit... Limited thinking. I think there's more nuance than that. That's economist for you. But but but, <laughs> but but there might be some merit in understanding where those properties are, um, who's living in those properties, and whether or not somewhere in the system that could be useful. So definitely there's untapped capacity in the system. And the last one is untapped buildings that could be converted into accommodation. Um, and Paul, uh, Rob Pratteline has been leading the charge on that a little bit, you would have seen in the video, but a conversion of an office space in George Street in Brisbane, for example, that used to be um, a commercial tower has just been converted to student accommodation. I'd love to see some of that happening more for residential development because we need that in the inner city urban areas. And that's, that's a lot quicker than building a new tower, trust me, at the yeah. moment. And, and I mean, just on that, I think certainly my experience in the UK was that can be done fantastically well and it can be done fantastically badly. And, and so... This is part of Gold Coast Open House, Gold Coast Open House uh, architecturally inspired uh, event and we rely on our architecture colleagues to ensure that those kind of conversions are done to a yes. high quality. It can, absolutely can be done, uh, but you know, if you leave the architects out, it'll probably be done uh, rather poorly. I just think, I read something the other day, a very interesting piece about looking at yeah, they underutilize the spare bedrooms. You know, if, if, if you're living in a four bedroom house and there's one or two of you left, um, you know, it's not to say that everyone wants somebody to come in and, and live in their house with them, but for people that do, often there are anxieties around the financial repercussions. You know, am I going to get stung for capital gains tax in the future? Is it going to affect my pension eligibility? So I think there are things that can be done to A, allay fears. Or B, if the fears are genuine, to do some minor tweaks yep. to the legislation to say, yeah, you can do that. And, and I think politicians can do, if there's a will, that's something that can be done quite easily. It's not expensive at all compared to some other policy interventions. It's not like abolish negative gearing, uh, which would save a lot of money. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think there are lots of things to be done. Um, look, we... As I anticipated at the outset, you know, we could be here for hours having a discussion, uh, but we...
I, I just <laughs> thought of a peculi peculiarity about the Gold Coast, actually. <laughs> Took you this long. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, share, yeah. share it, share it with yeah, us, yeah, Greg. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Gold Coast is a very unique um, metropole in that it does not have a lot of convents or um, or those old residencies, oh, yeah. because in a lot of the other Australian uh, cities, especially the larger ones, there's all the old nuns' convents, and the, that can be converted into medium-term accommodation. But there's hotels and motels here that are, uh, and one's been um, picked up by the state government and being converted. To yeah, a move for emergency accommodation. Yeah. Yeah. And the other one there too, Gregory, just I know we're going to wrap up, but it's just the, the faith-based um, land. There actually are a lot of churches though, and with, with latent capacity on their land, who, who actually do want to play a role in this space. I think they play yeah. a big role in this space. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. a lot of opportunity yeah. here. Look, I'm I am reluctantly going to have to draw it to a close um, and to give some thanks uh, to our panellists, Maggie, Gregory and Jackson, to Hota for, I never know whether to say Hota, that sounds a bit English, doesn't it? Hota, sorry. Um, Home of the Arts, uh, for hosting this evening and for the AV guys and the camera well man, done. Paul, for uh, filming it and for looking after us so well. To Jemima and our fellow members of the Gold Coast Open House organising committee, um, and to Melissa, I don't know if she's, I can't see her if she's in, but for who's been helping us with logistics and the promotion of the event. And last but certainly not least, to you for coming along and showing your interest and uh, support for this. I think it's very important, so thank you for coming and staying. Just join me in thanking the panellists. Uh, and there is, uh, just before I let you go, as they say on the radio, um, this coming weekend is the main weekend of Gold Coast Open House, so there there will be houses and other buildings that are open that you're uh, encouraged to visit. There are guided walks. There's You can sketch if you're into sketching. There's urban sketching. It might be booked out, but if not, go to that. There's a photography competition. There's two more panel discussions Uh here, not necessarily in this room, but here uh, at, on Sunday. One looking at um, alternative imaginative uses for community spaces, existing community spaces, and another one on looking at the Gold Coast in the future as a more resilient city in the face of not necessarily housing and homelessness, but some of the kind of natural disasters like flooding and bushfire risks uh, that we confront. So that's happening. All the details are on the our Gold Coast Open House website, Facebook page, uh, and there's a brochure which is probably outside that you can pick up as well. So thank you for coming and have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. So how did you find uh, the panel discussion this evening? I found it very inspiring, especially in the framework of open houses, which uh, is usually architects or the so-called middle class. Mm -hmm. I think it was a very brave move to include the problems mm -hmm. and also within the context of housing, building architecture, fantastic panel members who brought the broader context of homelessness, especially for older women. Mm -hmm. Um, and also hopefully will change the stigma of um, that is still lingering. Um, I know for me I had so many takeaways from both the screening of Undercover but also the panel discussion. What's your one takeaway of new information? My goal I take home is that my emails, my phone calls to uh, people who can make decisions can have a great influence and getting friends, neighbours on board might actually start the ball rolling. And we got a few practical solutions, links even on people's website. So my takeaway is yes, let's go and do it. Every little bit counts. How did you find it? Well, it was amazing to hear 
a different opinion. So Maggie was great to have a little bit deep understanding what is really happening. I had a completely different idea was the reasons that a woman um, would get in this situation. Of. So actually for me it was better understanding, it was amazing to her all the different opinions and understand about this issue. It's a big discussion so it was just a little step into it so uh, bring me to do more about it and be more connected with a group that we have been in touch here. I, I agree I feel like we've just touched or scratch the surface. Yeah, pretty um, much. And I, you know, hopefully this is a catalyst for continued conversation. What was your one main takeaway that was something new for you? New for me uh, was about what we could do as individuals, what we could do in a political scenario. That was new, something that I would not come by myself. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, um, for this evening's event. Um, you've been the um, MC, MC yeah. driver, the force yeah. behind um, this incredible concept um, in us screening undercover yep. and then the panel discussion. Yep. Um, if you'd like to just give some insight and thoughts into how you felt um, it went and some of the um, specific takeaways I think from the panel would be great. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. One of the women in the audience who asked a question, um, she, I was doing some work with her and a couple of her friends who were looking to build their own tiny homes to live in uh, down in Corumbin. And so I was doing some work with them about a year ago and then we were going to put on an event uh, and then they decided to focus more on actually acquiring the skills to build their own tiny homes and they said we so we won't put on the event um, and then they said to me oh you know that undercover film you should you should show that why don't you show that and I we were starting to plan this year's Gold Coast open house and I thought and I said why don't we show undercover because it's a bit of a kind of antidote to mm -hmm. You know, opening up really nice, impressive, smart houses on the Gold Coast. You know, you go, well, there's there's people who their home is going to be a car. Are we going to? You can have open home. You can come and come and look around my van. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea. I'd seen the film, the documentary, on TV, and I remembered it being very powerful and moving. Um, and then we thought we'd have a discussion. So you know, luckily we got um, Maggie and Jackson Gregory. Um, so that was really good. Um, I think what I take away from it is the fact that, I mean, they are, the, the women that feature in the documentary are extraordinary, but they're also very ordinary. You know, it's kind of that you can imagine that, you know, that's your, that's your mum, that's your nan, that's your auntie, that's your neighbour. She used to teach me at school. It's, it's affecting people, as they say, they weren't expecting that. They go, oh, I never anticipated that I was on a path to homelessness and sleeping in a car, but I am, you know, and, it, and it, uh, I'm not a drug addict. I don't have severe mental health problems or something like that. Um, but, you know, through no fault of my own, I suddenly find myself in this really vulnerable position. So I think getting that message across to people that it's affecting people like their mums and nans and aunties is... I think the most important thing, because when people realise that it's kind of close to home, they're more likely to, I hope, be prepared to take some action or put a bit of political pressure on their their local councillors or their state members or their federal members. So, yeah, let's hope so. We've got, you know, we've got a state election in a couple of weeks and we might have a federal election next year. We're a few years off, we've had our local ones, but you know, these opportunities come around and as a number of people said, we just need to kind of put those questions to our, the people who want to represent us. Say, well, okay, fine, if you want to represent me, what are you going to be doing about this? Mm -hmm. You know, make a commitment, not just a kind of wishy-washy promise. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I hope that comes, I hope we get people go away taking messages and lessons like that out of it. I know for me, I've 
I had so many takeaways and a lot of new learnings. One thing that resonated was the visibility or lack of visibility for homelessness in women. You see yeah, yeah. men and, you know, women living in cars because of security, that, um, that really resonated. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, I thought, one of the powerful points that came across in the documentary was, was you know, that feeling of kind of shame and embarrassment that it, that it, I mean, you wouldn't notice necessarily, like I say, you go to the surf club car parks here, go to those at six o'clock in the morning and the car parks are full. The telltale sign is they've probably got towels hanging in the windows. That's their curtains. But it's not visible. It's not, it's not the traditional view. It's not somebody on a park bench or it's not sleep, someone sleeping on a piece of cardboard in a shop doorway in the CBD, if we had one. Um, so it's not that traditional, very visible image. I mean, you are seeing more of that not so much on the Gold Coast, probably because we don't have, you know, we're not a kind of CBD type place, but Brisbane, you're seeing more of it. And go to American cities, you know, wealthy, prosperous places, go to San Francisco. I mean, it, it, there are significant areas that are one block from a really schmick part of town where the, the sidewalk will be full of tents. And that's in the middle of San, San Francisco. So, you know, that could be a harbinger of things to come here. So, but at the moment, it's still relatively invisible in that sense. But unless we do something, it's going to get more and more visible. It, it's not going to diminish. I don't see any signs that unless we actually start intervening and pulling some of those policy levers and doing something differently, if, we, if it's business as usual, it's going to become more pronounced and more visible. And the worry is that then that starts provoking very negative reactions, you know, blaming the victims and saying, you know, it's their own fault. We've got to clear them off the streets. I mean, that's just profoundly unhelpful. So. I really feel in the conversations that I've had after the screening and the panel, this has been a catalyst for continued conversation. Yeah. And I think it's events like this that can help make a difference, make change, force change. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I hope so. We, I mean, we haven't kind of scheduled any a follow up, but I mean, the people who were both on the panel and maybe people in the audience have made connections and will go, actually, I'm going to raise this now in the forum that I participate in. Um, so I hope that will happen. It can be frustrating, certainly, I think, for people who are kind of in working in this field. Um, they go, I want to see some action. I want to see something concrete, not just a discussion about the nature of the problem. I mean, I, maybe it's because I'm, I'm an academic, but I, I, do, I don't think it, it hurts to kind of look at the nature of the problem if our understanding of the problem needs to be shifted. If, if we continue to think this is a problem because of the personal failings of those people who are sleeping on the benches or in the cars, it, it's not. So there is still an educational piece to do to shift the dial on, on that. But we also know, need to be thinking, yeah, what can we do concretely and specifically? And as came up in the discussion, you know, if there's a proposal to, to build some social housing in your neighborhood, or a women's refuge, or the temporary use of a car, you know, a vacant parking lot uh, to allow people who live in cars to do so safely and securely, then before you immediately start going, oh, we don't want this, there goes the neighbourhood, just think about it and go, actually, if I'm going to object to this, where else is it going to happen? You know, I, it, it's all very well saying it's a problem and acknowledging it's a problem, but then if you say, I don't want the solution to be anywhere near where I live, I don't think that's good enough. It's challenging, though, but that's what we've got to do. We've got to start shifting our attitudes and, and our behaviours as well. Can be